So welcome everyone to the last session in the referee track for today. And uh, thanks a lot for the organizers for accepting the, uh, the proposal and so on. And the point of this talk is I was working in the RT team for around a year here in Unitronics. And I noticed a pattern of development that a lot of the core kernel developers, of course, know, but a lot of the normal day-to-day -day kernel developers, let's call it this way, do not know, which is that even though when you hear RT, you think it's a very specialized thing, it actually affects not just the core kernel components, but also all of the rest of the kernel and all of the rest of the subsystems. And the idea of this talk is to show that RT is not a containerized subsystem. It's not uh, only plays in its own sandbox. It affects actually the entire kernel and a lot of other subsystems in a very positive way. And this is what we show. And it is no longer niche also in the development and so on. So let me move the slides to the second one. Okay, it works. So the expected audience of this presentation is basically first kernel developers and driver developers. So again, also before I did this RT stuff for a while, I was just also doing like normal driver development and kernel development like a PCI driver or a CAN driver or something like that. And the, co the core subsystems and the core development is actually not just much more fun, but it's actually also much more challenging because you have to adapt to a lot of competing uh, demands and you have to adapt to a lot of different call sites with competing needs. And this makes the challenge of development much harder, but also much more fun. And this is part of the reason of this talk, showing this a little bit to a wider audience, I hope. Uh, the other audience, expected audience of this presentation is basically advanced users of CAMTRT. And these are not just users um, they, they actually use CMRT in, in their products and uh, in, in very industrial products and manufacturing and so on. So they are quite advanced, they are not run of the mill users. And the idea is to show uh, how CMRT development is done behind the scenes and how it's actually also to a little bit appreciate also more the complexity of the task at hand because it looks a little bit easier from the outside, but actually from an implementation perspective, uh, it's much more complex than uh, what it seems. So, yeah. So to continue some, some continuity in the talk, I was talking about having kernel, uh, the target audience as kernel developers and PMRT advanced users. The also the other target audience is subsystem maintainers. And the idea is to show that preempt RT helps your subsystem implicitly and explicitly. It's not just uh, like these crazy guys working on laser cutting machines or something like that. Actually, when you get some patches, it most Mo almost all of the time it actually helps your subsystem before it helps RT. And I hope this also shows this in this presentation. And uh, yeah, if you are the local system maintainers and up, then you already know all of what I'm going to say today. So, yeah. so given that rumors have they are just very core kernel developers. So I would like to give a small introduction about PMDRT 
and uh, what it does and how it does it in, in a small in a small amount of time. So preempt RT basically transforms the Linux kernel, which is a general purpose operating system, into a hard real-time OS. And uh, the really beneficial part of this, like, so what, we already have a lot of hard real-time OSs like VxWorks and QNX and others, but the, the really nice part is, of course, it is still 100% Linux, so it still maintains full user space API compatibility. So all of your applications, all of you, your user space applications work as usual. And it also maintains full in kernel API compatibility, which means that all of the existing uh, drivers, which is huge, of course, and one of the large benefits of Linux, it's a huge repository of well, mostly file statement drivers, uh, actually work also out of the box. So, so it's so it's all that screen as I said, you can have your cake and eat it. You still you have a real time OS while still having all the huge repository of the Linux kernel drivers, which costed a huge amount of man hours to develop, and also all of the user space works as expected. So. so the main idea of having uh, uh, a hard read file system is to minimize the sources, the, the sources of latency in the system and the sources of scheduling interference. And scheduling interference can happen, especially in a general purpose OS, by a huge amount of sources. So, of course, the very first one is interrupts in their handlers. So, you have your, your process running, and then if you have a large interrupt, an interrupt handler that actually bigger than usual or bigger than expected, then it's actually stealing runtime from the, the highest priority RT task in the system. You have also in Linux uh, soft interrupts, and soft interrupts are basically, they run most of the time at the end of uh, an interrupt, they run with interrupts enabled, so that's okay, but the problem is you need to disable preemption. And by disabling preemption, it means that the scheduler cannot switch the running into another task. So if you have a higher priority task, then it's still waiting idle all the time while the software interrupt is executing. So imagine you have a high priority task controlling uh, a very important sensor or a very important uh, actuator and it's blocked on the software interrupt from the Wi-Fi driver or something like this. Uh, there is also interrupt disabled, uh, interrupt disabled machines and sometimes drivers do that but mostly not nowadays thankfully. Uh, and preemption disabled regions and also the, the Linux concurrency mechanisms also affect the uh, the latency uh, the latency and the ability of the scheduler to as I mentioned at the start of the side allow to schedule at any point in time. So to really have a preemptible OS you want to be able to schedule at almost any point in time. If if, if a task wants to run then as soon as possible you you run it without unbounded latency. So, what the MTRT, of course, uh, this is just a very small summary. The, big, the picture is much bigger than this. But in general, what the MTRT patch and now almost mainline does is that, okay, it says that I have my interrupt handlers. So, I don't want these interrupt handlers to, uh, to delay other possibly more important tasks. So the idea is I will run them in a schedulable context. And the schedulable context means that it is like a thread and then I can prioritize that thread. Then I can also let the scheduler control this thread and so on. And this way I can uh, run the highest priority task. There are of course also special cases, so, but yeah, these are outside the scope of this presentation, 
the, also for soft interrupts, uh, the preemptrt runs them exclusively in threat context. Mainline runs them most of the time in soft IRQ context, but it can run them in, in threat context under pressure. But for preemptrt, they run exclusively under uh, threat context. So again, the scheduler can control them and can prioritize them, and you as a user can have your task with a higher priority than maybe a certain interrupt handler or a certain or the software interrupt handling and so on. So the spinning blocks, they are also a problem for real-time kernels in general, because if you have a spinning block, then usually it means that you need to disable interrupts. Uh, if uh, if you can actually, if if some of the interrupt handlers actually acquire the same spin lock, then you need to disable interrupts. Otherwise, you will get a deadlock on the same CPU, and the entire core will die. Uh, you need also to disable preemption, of course. Otherwise, another task can get can uh, then you can get preempted off the CPU and another task tries to acquire this spin lock and then it waits the entire scheduling tech just uh, just spinning which no one wants so and rt also replaces this with rt mutexes except in very special cases uh, and and then rt mutexes have priority inheritance and so on there's also blocking blocks in general also for preempt rt they they use the RT mutexes with priority inheritance to, to make sure that the highest priority task is not blocked by lower priority uh, tasks in the case of locking dependencies and so on. So the first part of this talk is about something called sequence counters and sequential locks. And the idea of sequence counters is that they are a reader writer consistency mechanism but they only allow lockless readers and no writers starvation and by this it means that writers can always run so a writer can never be blocked by a reader okay and the, the catch is if the, the reader has to must be able to retry the section and because yeah if you have everything in the same time then you will get uh race conditions and so on so the idea is that this mechanism actually favors uh, writers uh make sure that writers can never starve and you can have an arbitrary large number of readers that don't block each other So and this mechanism is usually for data that's rarely referred to. So system time, statistics, and so on, because if you think about it, most of the time you read the time, not set the time, and so on. Uh, statistics also, uh, in a lot of cases, you read, uh, you write the statistics in much less frequency than reading them. And in, in the kernel hot code pathers, in very specific areas in DFS and memory management and so on uh, it's also used as a common as a cheap dry lock mechanism and the idea is that because sequence counters do not use atomic operations for example x86 they do not raise the lock signal which actually uh, yeah synchronizes the caches and so on which is a, which is a heavy operation so it can also be used Although this is a very special case in very, very hot kernel code pathos and not the usual. And there is a small file actually documenting all of this, which we wrote just during all the RT development, which I will be taking in the following slides. So I'm happy that there is no technical issues anymore. Yeah. So the working mechanism is actually acceptably simple for sequence counters and we will see each write micro and read micro is actually two lines and so on so the idea is that you have a counter which is i start set at zero and then the writes 
when a writer starts its write section, it increases the counter. And when it ends the write section, it also increases the counter. And the idea is the reader can actually know if there is a writer in progress by seeing, okay, is the counter odd at the start of the read section? Because if it is odd, then this means that a driver, uh, a writer is already, a write section is already active. But this check is also not enough because maybe it's even, but why the read section is, let's assume a big read section, while it is executing, uh, a full read, a full write section was executed, uh, like let's go in this area. So the idea is you also check for if the counter has changed at the end of the read section to make sure that this, that this does not happen. So actually, if at the start of the read section, if the counter is odd, and at the end of the section, the counter, uh, if the counter is even, and at the end of the section, the counter did not change, then actually you are sure that what you have read is consistent and then you can continue on. But if this is not the case, then you know that you have read inconsistent data and then you retry again. And you keep retrying until you make sure that you actually read consistent data. So as you see here, this is why writers are more favored in this case, if you think about it. But because they happen very rarely, so actually this read, the retry loop on the read side rarely happens. So if you use sequence counters correctly, it should happen them in scenarios where writes are very rare. So. so these are basically what we talked about in the previous slide. And here you see this is the start of the write section and you see here the counter is increasing. And the end of the right section, and you also see the counter should be here. I'm not seeing it, but I hope you, you do. Let me zoom out a bit. Okay. So then you see also the counter increasing. And of course, for this to work, you need proper pairings and memory barriers and so on. So you need like the right memory barriers, and it pairs actually with the end of the read section, so it's an X, actually, it's, a, it's an X pairing duration tree. But why is it an X pairing is outside the scope of this presentation. And for the read section, this is actually the retry loop we talked about. So here at the start of the read section, if the counter is odd, then you keep looping until you make sure that it is even. And then at the end of the read section, if the counter is, uh, did not change, then you know that you, things are okay. But if it did change, then you need to actually re-execute the read section again. So even though the image is simple, there are still some requirements to make sure that this mechanism works. And the first requirement, of course, is here on the writer side, you cannot just let writers run together and increase counters. They will, of course, cause race conditions. So you must have some rights serialization mechanism. And the rights serialization mechanism is basically to make sure that there are no race conditions and that the counter value here is valid all the time and it's not corrupted. And this is the first requirement. Which is quite simple. You can use a spin log and mutex, any any kind of synchronization. This is uh, okay. The second requirement is you also need to have preemption disabled for the right section. And if you think about it, this is also because if you have preemption enabled, then you actually risk the reader preempting the writer and if the reader preempts the writer then in it is possible that it will enter the loop forever because like it is preempting the entity which is which uh, the only entity which will actually allow it to make forward progress 
So it has stopped the writer, and the writer is the only thing which will actually allow it to go forward. And then it live locks. So this is, of course, a very bad scenario that no one wants. So this means that also here preemption must be uh, disabled. And the idea of disabling preemption when talking about the usual main, the mainline kernel is simple. If you use a spin lock, for example, or a read write lock, which is a form of a spinning lock, then preemption is automatically disabled for you, right? But if you use something like uh, a mutex or a weight wound mutex or something like that or a semaphore, then you will actually need to manually disable preemption. Otherwise, it will risk drive locking the kernel. And I will show you later that we actually quote like six or seven cases where people forgot doing so. So, so this can be quite tricky. And when you check the right side as a code, it's here, for example, you see there is a right serialization lock, and our right serialization lock here is a mutex. And you see here, because this is a mutex, then there is a pre disabled, preemption is disabled over the sequence counter right section. And then the right serialization lock is, is released. If you are using a spin lock, then okay, you don't need to disable preemption, but you need to be careful because you don't also want to be interrupted by readers in interrupt handlers or bottom halves and so on. So if the sequence counter read section is in an interrupt or in a bottom half, then you also need to disable interrupts or bottom halves. The idea is generic, it's not just about preemption, it's that like I, I can never be interrupted by a read section of the same sequence counter. And that's it. Uh, and here is the read side. And as you notice here, there is basically the read set count begin, and then there is the, the retry loop at the end, which actually makes sure that, okay, if the number has changed, so sec, sec here is actually the sequence number, and here you are giving it for a check and then it says, okay, did the counter change or not? If it did not change, then I know that what I've read is consistent with any chart. So all of this is pure mainline, has no relation to RT at this stage, but it actually poses a lot of problems for RT. And the problems for RT is, I just said like two minutes ago or something that preemption must be disabled, right? And I mentioned implicitly, but let's talk about the explicit case. So here, for example, we have uh, a right section and they are using a blocking lock and then they are doing a, a preem disable. And having a preem disable over such a region, and if it's especially big, then this means you, uh, no higher priority RT task can schedule on that CPU, which means latency, which is the definition of latency actually, that a task wants to run on the CPU, but it is blocked by something. And we actually, this is not just a theoretical case. So for example, in the DRM stack and the graphics stack, especially because the graphics stack have a very heavy code change, uh, this was actually noticeable, and we will see how this problem is solved. The other issue is, even if you are using the spin lock as the right serialization mechanism, for RT preemption, spin locks are not, they are actually replaced by RT mutexes, and preemption is not disabled. This means actually that your sequence counter right section can be preempted by a reader, which means that the reader can actually infinite loop and live lock the kernel. So this means that, okay, the kernel can be live locked, so the kernel is basically broken, but this problem is not solved. So these are the challenges for preempt RT, latency and readers interrupting, uh, preempting writers, and live locking the kernel. So 
there was a solution first in the external PMDRT patch. So historically, the PMDRT patch was an external, but over the years, year by year, more parts of it are getting mainline. So before this part was mainline, this part is actually mainline now, but I wanted to show how it was done before the mainline to do a comparison. So before it was actually mainline, let's say that the call site was having a mutex or a way to move mutex as the right serialization mechanism. Then this means that this call site, if it was not buggy and it was correct, actually had manual and disabled enabled, like we had problems, for example, with the graphics type. This means actually that the preempt RT patch had to patch the call site, like graphics drivers and network drivers and stuff like that, and say, ah, oh, okay, if not defined preempt RT, no, 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 don't do, uh, uh, if, 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 it is, if it is preempt RT, do not do the preempt the same. And this, of course, is an acceptable solution for an external patch, but when we want to have RT mainline, which was like, this was the last year development, this is not an acceptable for mainline. So no, no, no maintainer would like to have their drivers uh, polluted with if defined preempt RT. And even Thomas and others also care very much about this, that preempt RT does not pollute any uh, any of the drivers of the external subsystems and so on. So it should be as transparent as possible to most of the kernel subsystems. And this is the beauty of it, right, otherwise. And so the solution that actually the preempt RT patch did was that, okay, for each sequence counter, it will include, it will carry, like introduce its own spin lock and you and always acquire that spin lock at the start of the right section and release that spin lock at the end of the right section okay okay you will a uh, fair question is why do you do that we already know that if the code was not buggy then the sequence counter right sections are not serialized right but the idea is of introducing this lock is because preemptrt do not want to disable preemption so for the for right sections so it wants to somehow break the live lock when it happens so one way to break the live lock which we talked about is okay we have the reader section we have the read section here and the read section at the start it asks as usual is the counter on and if the answer is yes then this actually means that it is possible that this reader preempted its own write section, which means that it is possible that this is a live log scenario. So what the preempt RT patch did, which was a patch by Thomas very long time ago, like 10 years ago, was that, okay, we know that the writer actually has this spin lock acquired because we modified the second count implementation right so if the reader actually acquires that same spin lock then the live lock scenario will break because basic kernel scheduling will say okay i'm trying to acquire a lock that's already locked so i will let the owner of this lock to continue running so what will happen is that the right lock will actually break and the right section will be allowed to run. So remember that we interrupted the right section, but even though we interrupted it because we acquire the same lock that it's already acquired, then it, we actually allow it to continue until the end. And this way we can actually break the live lock and allow the reader to make progress, to make forward progress. And this actually breaks the entire live lock, so it's not a problem anymore. Yeah, it's a little bit complicated, but it actually works. So there is no problem with that. So there were two problems when trying to mainline such, such a solution. Let me go to the next slide. 
So we know it solves the latency issues, right? Because preemption is not disabled for the right side. So this is very good for RT, no preemption disabled. Life is good. And we also know that it fixes the reader uh, live lock issues in different cubes. But the disadvantage is it sometimes requires modifications on call sites, like graphics drivers and network drivers and so on. And again, this is not acceptable for mainline. The second issue is that it introduces an extra lock on the right side. And even though RT is not about throughput, it's actually, it is still preferred that many, many intensive solutions are picked. So if we can avoid introducing an extra lock, then of course, this is much better. So, so the question is, do we really need this extra lock? The whole reason this extra lock was introduced was actually to break the live lock on the reader side. But if we have a reference to the right serialization lock, then we can actually break this live lock also without introducing extra locks. So Thomas actually asked me to do a survey on the whole call sides of the sequence counters. And the idea is to actually understand uh, what all the call sites does. And this was actually really nice because it was from a personal perspective for me, it was like the first time I, w I worked before with other subsystem maintainers, let's call, and people who work in their own sandboxes and so on. And everyone usually cares about their own sandbox and don't care about the entire kernel. And it was actually quite fun to, 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 work with, uh, to work in a way that we actually don't care only about uh, one subsystem or even RT. So most of the RT development we do is actually, yes, it fixes RT. Oops. Oops. Yeah, it looks like we might have a. Looks like we may have a frozen on that again. Okay, let me join. The presenter dropped down to change. Interesting how this thing works. Okay. As he comes back, I'll move it over to him. I think what happens in Clark is when the presenter drops it drops down to the next list, and you were the next on the list last time. Ah, uh, that's what happened. Yeah, because uh, I'm seeing James has got it now. <laughs> I see James has it, yeah. Now I'm going to grab it and so I can take it from there. I don't want it. I, I'm sure you don't. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I think we all want Amit to continue. Yeah, so, so I don't know now. what's happening. My apologies again. No problem. Uh, I hope you hear me. Just pulling the time for you. Just a second. I'm your big, you back to be a presenter. Okay, thank you. It's, this whole connection issue is making me more nervous than usual. But anyway, so <laughs> so uh, yeah. So the so the idea of this survey was basically that let's have uh, let's have a good understanding of what the call sites does, and then we can find the solution that satisfy all of these users uh, while solving our RT problem. And I hope you heard this part before the connection goes down. I was saying that, yeah, it was, this was the first time I was actually like think about the kernel as a whole and not just about our own sandbox and so on. So there were actually around 26 code sites. So sequence counters are a, a little bit of a specialized mechanism in the kernel. Uh, yeah, I discovered that there was a lot of call sites that actually forgot to disable preemption on the right side when they were using uh, blocking locks. Uh, some call sites actually also abused the sequence counter API quite badly, honestly. And uh, yeah, the usage was completely broken, so it has no relation whatsoever to sequence counters. And uh, yeah. 
So we fixed actually all of these cases first. So, so if you see here, if you can, if you if you download the PDF on by your own on your side, you will see that uh, here are all commits that actually fixes uh, a lot of invalid sequence counter usage in multiple subsystems, network subsystem, block layer, others. So it was different. Uh, yeah, so here, for example, the sequence counter was used in, in an invalid context, so a read-write semaphore was much more, uh, was one of the correct ways to solve the problem that the core layer was having here. Uh, preemption was not disabled in multiple places. Uh, yeah, so in the, in the swap code, uh, sec count latching was used, but it was unrelated to set count latches and uh, yeah even Peter got angry about that so uh, and uh, yeah so so we fixed all of these cases and uh, and I was like timing out but but I was actually happy while doing all of this because it's looking at the kernel from Do you hear me? Yes. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. It, it told me lost in your connection. So. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so that's why I thought it's okay. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, oh, oh, and, and these was, and all of these fixes were actually done before starting doing anything RT. So the idea was, okay, let's first clean the plate and make sure that all of the call sites are actually correct. And then let's see the, let's see what to do with them. And since we are already fixing all of these call sites, then also let's make sure that no more bugs of this nature will happen in the future, which is good for RT and good for the kernel in general. So, for example, uh, I added like a lot of lock depth checks to make sure that preemption is disabled in the right places. Uh, that the right serialization lock is held when it should be held. Uh, I also noticed that, I mean, when you have a when you have a kernel API and you see a lot of subsystems using the trunk, then it's also possible that it's not the fault of the subsystems, right? And now we froze. <laughs> okay. Thomas and I were just boggling at the idea of Peter getting upset at anything. <laughs> just the, I just can't imagine. Really? That's really hard to imagine. I know. <laughs> like I was rejoining. So we're seeing microphone thing kick in. So hopefully we'll have him back soon. I don't know, Thomas. I think Ahmed needs a better internet connection. Pardon? I think Ahmed needs a better internet connection. Is he calling in from the Linutronics office or from home? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I assume he's, he's at home. Ah, okay. Yeah, but uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on the internet connection in the office either, so. Uh, he's got a Germany, cheap, he's probably got a cheap boss or something, don't you think, Kate? Germany he wants to is a, for a good connection. <laughs> Germany is a third world developing country in terms of internet con connectivity. Oh, yeah, blame it on the country now. Okay, okay I'm going to drop again. <laughs> Oops, no, we lost him. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I'm here. He'll okay. be back. There he yeah. is. He's back. Woo okay, I mean, it's Oberling and it's a nice place, so I don't know. 
so uh, yeah so yeah so what I was talking about was also that uh, when you see that a lot of subsystems are not using an API in a correct way then it's also possible that either number one this API is really not designed in a good way to facilitate correct use or at least this API is not well documented right so we can like yeah okay point fingers at call sites and say oh look at this they are using this bad and they are using that bad and so on but it's also uh, uh, but it's also that yeah it's it also means that at least the api is not well documented and uh this is why while also doing all this work i thought okay it's a good opportunity so kernel docs was created for each of the apis and sequence counters i only showed like start write section end write section start read section end read section but actually the APIs are quite complex. There are a lot of uh, var variants in there, and uh, they are very delicate. And sometimes it's actually hard to know which is doing which. So, uh, yeah, I try to help this problem by adding proper kernel doc for each for each exported function, and also there added like a big picture documentation under documentation locking. So, so under documentation locking seclock.rst, then you, we warn you that if you are using sequence counters, you should have a right serialization lock. You should have preemption disabled. You should disable interrupts or bottom halves if the read section can be invoked from uh, interrupts or bottom halves or something like that, and so on. And uh, yeah, after all the call sites actually and the bug fixes and cleanups were done, so after like i don't know like 30 patches that was merged mainline bug fixes to call sites documentation reorganization documentation and so on uh, then the solution to actually associate the right serialization lock to the sequence counter makes sense because all the call sites were now using the api the sequence counter apis in a correct way and uh yeah so we introduced all of these new sequence counter types, and these are safer sequence counter types. So by design, the main sequence counter type is called seccount underscore T. And now if you go to include Linux seclock.h, you see seccount spinlock T, row spinlock T, read write lock T, mutex, wound weight mutex, and so on. And the idea is that the write serialization lock is, uh, is uh, yeah is associated with uh, with the uh, with the sequence counter. So the benefits of this is for mainline is that we have a lot of extra lock depth checks to make sure that the rights. Are Okay, you just asked me to do that. I have no clue what the slides look like, so but I try. Okay. <laughs> well, you've got five minutes. So go for, uh, okay. I, read faster. I I pull a row step. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so associating the locks is uh, helping with reliability because we really can instrument it with lock taps. So uh, aside of that, uh, for a non RT kernel. Um, the association of the lock has no no impact at all. And what we were able to do is actually to move the preempt disable into the sequence lock uh, right aside. So this is not longer a requirement on the on the calling code. It's actually done underneath, and that helps our T uh, in in two ways. So. Uh, let me let me figure out whether whether that's explained in the next slide. Um, yes, yeah, so so that's how it looks like from the initialization side. You have a mutex image. You associate it when initializing the sequence count, and then you just do 
the right sequence can begin and everything is correctly done inside. Um, and lock that will fail if you call write sequence count begin without holding the mutex, which is nice because we didn't have that before. <coughs> so what we what we do uh, what we how it helps our T to avoid the long preempt disabled sections is uh, on our T we always associate the lock to the sequence count. And if a writer holds uh, is preempted and uh, the reader actually sees that the, the counter is odd, which means the writer is in the critical section, and then we acquire the serialization lock because we have a pointer to it. So it's, it's completely invisible. The hacks we had before in RT were really ugly. But this one, one is rather elegant and it came, comes with the extra benefit uh, of being able to debug these things uh, even on a, on a non-RT kernel. So we have the, the latch sequence counter, uh, uh, we have formalized them as well. And now I'm done because time is pretty much over, so you can have some questions. I just saw Dolby come back, but now he's gone again. <laughs> yeah, I think I think maybe built in some time for questions in the microphone. Yes. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Yeah, we we can move the questions to 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 the, the real time micro conference uh, tomorrow if there are any, because we, as Kate said, we have to have to clean out the room for the following keynote session. Yeah, sorry, Kate, for all the hustling. It's okay, sorry, you're having to have to deal with so many problems. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, okay, this is the challenge of doing things live and virtual. So, we're good. Okay, well then, thank you very much, Hamid, and um, keep an eye open on the chat when you can get in. I think there's, I think there's been some progress on the um, matrix chat. Um, uh, I, I, it, the, the chat doesn't work for me at all uh um send details if it's still not working in half an hour send details <laughs> it's, just contact. Showing, it's just showing my circle ever ever circling oh in, inside the bbb session yes but if there's um if you look in the shared notes there's a link to the chat directly okay That's and so we've been trying to keep that going from there so okay Okay, well, thanks again, Ahmed, and I'm going to take back presenter and start to queue things up for our next speaker. Yeah, I was just going to say the chat should now be working vaguely. We have a scalability issue. We cut down a lot of the stuff, so you may just be able to use it. It's still going to take you about 40 seconds or so if you click on the chat matrix beta panel um, in BBB. But after you get in, it should be fine. Kate, in case I can't access the, the chat, you can. Can you can you forward me the questions which arise, and we can pick them up tomorrow? Sure. If there's things that are in the chat, or if things people can use, put in questions they want in the shared notes, and we'll make a copy of those and make those available tomorrow too. Right. Great. Because okay. right now that the even the separate matrix thing says there was a problem. Yeah. Yeah, I'm getting there too. Okay. Problem code, problem code is an M M underscore unknown, which is really <laughs> helpful. I know.